he is desperate to own his first Rolex. And he gets really frustrated at us, who are somewhat more jaded about the brand, occasionally. Interesting. And he really, really wants one. It is his aspirational watch to have an Explorer. But he can't afford it. And that, that's been a real change. I think it's been growing since the 90s and the influx of the collector sphere. Because, lest we forget, a Rolex watch was brought to the market to compete with Omega by being very rugged, but also much cheaper. Rolex watches were the cheaper option. If you take a vintage Rolex, the thing that we all love is honestly the fact that it's crap. Rattly bracelets, yeah. very, very simple cases, no complicated chronographs for the most part. They would do timing with loose bezels with no clicks in the early days. Those were those were cheaper watches. They, they, they couldn't compete with Omega in terms of quality, so they had to find a diversification, which is, well, let's go and make a watch for professionals and let's make it affordable. If you've got somebody who is starting out, could you give me a top three to look at? Best value for money for what you're spending and you're going to get a fantastic bit of kit that you'll probably still have in 10 years' time. So the three watches I'd pick would probably all be Seiko's, to be honest. If there was one watch to buy that you could say categorically, this is one of the greatest of all time and it will never let you down, what would you choose? I know I'm putting you on the spot here. A single watch, <laughs> what would you choose? Well, it is, I, I struggled with this question myself for a very long time in terms of a personal purchase because I knew what that watch was, but I didn't want to accept it. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Watch Gecko YouTube channel with myself, Richard, the editor of the magazine. Uh, we do enjoy these casual random chats that we have on the magazine. Today, we're very lucky because we've got a special guest. Welcome the one and only Andrew Morgan. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Richard. Thank you for having me on, and how are you? I'm, I'm just great. All the better for chatting to yourself. Now, obviously... <laughs> I'll see if I can change that. <laughs> yeah, let, let's go for it, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, you've got a fantastic presence on YouTube. We all know you from Watchfinder. Uh, great to have you here, get your insight, especially right hot on the heels of Watches and Wonders. Shall we start with that? Because, I mean, it's it's kind of obvious, it's like the elephant in the room. We've got to talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. The um, the Las Vegas of Switzerland, watches and wonders, a, a week with no natural sunlight and lots of crazy, crazy watches and stands. It's always an experience I come away from feeling a little bit like uh, it was a fever dream because nothing there is is quite normal, is it? It's far from normal, isn't it? And do you think? As the show progresses, it's becoming even further from normality. <laughs> I remember the, the Basel World Days and experiencing some of that. Uh, it's, it's always been an impressive display of what's possible with the right budget. I remember uh, one thing that sticks in my mind was Breitling Stand, where they had a tropical fish tank on the first floor. For the Americans listening, that's the second floor. Uh, and the whole thing was just an unbelievable display and Watches and Wonders has added even further to that with a lot of beige and no natural sunlight. So the whole thing, you, you enter in the morning and when you come out again in the evening, you're surprised to see the sun again. <laughs> um, so I think the difference between those two shows has, has really emphasised just how wild Watches and Wonders really is. Mm. I think it's really interesting because obviously we had a film crew there and uh, unfortunately I couldn't go, but um, the guys have come away questioning whether they're watch guys or not. And I think in that one <laughs> statement, that's hugely telling. I think so. I think so. I think there's a, a lot for Watches and Wonders to learn for future shows to bring more of the passion there. They bring the show and I think they can bring more of the passion. And there are some brands there that do an amazing job of that and some brands that uh, don't do it quite so well. Um, but coming away feeling despondent about watches is probably lots and lots of small bowls of odd food that they serve and probably a lack of vitamin D. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it really depends on the guys you speak to because the people are there who exhibit that passion, but you just have to find them in the throngs and throngs of people who are wandering up and down. In a previous interview uh, we did earlier this year with the CEO of a watch company, we were having a debate that this was the year of the GMT. So I'm just wondering, is this some now industry conspiracy to uh, deprive you of any natural light so you come away thinking you need a 24-hour GMT hand? <laughs> that, that's a, I like that. I like how in-depth that conspiracy theory is. I like when very small <laughs> details come behind very, very big budgets. 
Um, maybe, yeah. I don't think they've generally got a problem selling their watches at the moment. No. So uh, perhaps a step too far. Yeah. But I, I like the thinking. But you're giving them ideas. That's the main problem. Don't, certainly don't. Yeah. 2024 we'll, we'll all be plunged into darkness in 2024 <laughs> yeah it's, it's it'll be the watch year the of show loom via loom. <laughs> yeah. um so i mean looking at the the, the vast array of watches that, that came out were there any surprises for you were there any obvious predictions based on your experience so i think what i expected was to see smaller watches and to see more yellow gold and we definitely saw that um if you take rolex for example the 1908 it is, it's, it's a yellow gold piece. It's, it's quite unusual. But the 1908 itself, I did not expect. We have seen a delineation between Tudor and Rolex, where Tudor looks backwards and Rolex looks forwards, generally speaking. And for Rolex to go, actually, should we go and have a look back? A lot of our models now are really shiny and getting bigger. Let's, let's make the 1908 it was a really pleasant surprise to me. Um, and likewise for Tudor, looking even further back than they already have done with the 54 and making a smaller watch. A 37 millimeter diver. Now, nobody's asked for that, but secretly we all realize we want it. Um, I, I analogize this in, in one of my videos to the difference between the cool uncle and the parent that you really need. The parent you really need says, no, I think it's better you wear a smaller watch that's an appropriate size. Whereas the cool uncle's like, woo, get a hublot. And so that was a surprise for me. Uh, the other thing as well is there was a, there was less push for more watches overall. I think last year we saw lots and lots of brands showcasing lots and lots of watches and it was quite overwhelming and it was nicer this year i think for iwc to have a real focus on the ingenieur or jlc to have a real focus on the reverso or panerai with the radiomir it all felt a little bit more considered and a less less hectic and less overwhelming which makes makes our jobs of communicating what happened at watches and wonders a lot easier it means we can give more time to to individual models rather than having to go oh right oh, there's this and this and this and this and this no no yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, I, I've just written a piece that'll go up onto the magazine um, probably tomorrow where, um, as anybody who's read my writing will know, I have a bit of an issue with Rolex. I mean, to put it mildly. <laughs> I think a lot of people do. Yeah, I mean, I, I come at it from the perspective of a, 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 a an owner and mm -hmm. an owner three times over and an owner who feels sadly rejected by them as a particular demographic of buyer. Um there was a day when, you know, we were all hugely influenced by the cover pages of National Geographic magazine where there was some adventurous soul tracking across the, the Sahara with a Rolex and you think, gosh, I'd really like one of those. And mm -hmm. Whereas now it's more a bit um, celeby, dare, dare I say, with balloon with bubbles and jigsaws. And um, <laughs> I, for me, I, I set out to, I set out probably pre-prejudiced not to like what they introduced which is a terrible mm. thing to say. And then, damn them, they flummox me with a Titanium Yachtmaster, which I absolutely love. I'm going on record. I love it. <laughs> Caught me off guard with that. How did you feel about that? Well, you're probably equally as likely to get one whether you liked it or not. Uh, that, that is the, the real bone of contention, isn't it? But yeah, I, I think it's great. It seems this year showed a little bit of Rolex letting its hair down. And I think in previous years, all of this like, ooh, crown guards. Oh, left-handed. It was all a bit too... Everyone was taking Rolex a bit too seriously. Rolex was taking it too seriously. Collectors were taking it too seriously. Investors were taking it too seriously. Uh, and uh, whilst the Jigsaw watch and the Bubble watch aren't watches I would purchase, it shows a slightly different side of Rolex, a slightly more fun side. And I think the 1908 is a bit more letting their hair down and mm. will break some of our own rules of, of not looking back and, look, and only looking forwards. And the Yachtmaster as well sits very nicely for me alongside the Explorer too. It's a little bit more beefed up. It's a little bit more casual. I do find it funny that they, they said when they introduced the Deep Sea Challenge, which was not that long ago, and introduced titanium with that, they said titanium is for our most extreme watches only. And then Yachtmaster <laughs> 42 in titanium, the least extreme watch in the collection. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it, it's, it's great to see that diversification. And to be honest... I think Rolex is trying. They want to up their production so more people can have them, but they're just so popular. I, mm. I honestly don't think it is a, a conspiracy with the manufacturer withholding. They're, they're making as many watches as they can, and they, they are selling them and selling them and selling them. Um, and fingers crossed that the future of Rolex means that we can start getting them. It's really, and this is, this is an industry-wide thing and even a global thing, 
the average cost of things is where I get stuck, where I could purchase a Submariner 10 years ago for two and a half thousand pounds, you know, $3,000. And now to buy that same watch is vastly, vastly more expensive. We've all been frogs in a hot pan when it comes yeah. to Rolex pricing, and we've not noticed how it's gotten away from us. Uh, well, as I'm constantly reminded at home, I actually couldn't afford my Rolex now. <laughs> yeah. So I'm really and that glad makes it I scary to wear. I did. Yeah, uh, I spent, I, I, I have no secrets here, I spent just shy of £3,000 on an Explorer 2 in about 2005. And it would be out of my budget now. Yeah, um, and you did the sensible and I, thing and kept it. I saw, I sold yeah. myself, Mariner. <laughs> Damn. Like an idiot. Um, and it's really interesting because one of our guest authors that writes for us, um, we're not all grey-haired guys in our 50s, the guys who write the magazine. We've got one chap who's 24, and he's right at the beginning of his journey, and we're all finding it fascinating to be on this journey with him. Mm -hmm. He is desperate to own his first Rolex, and he gets really frustrated at us who are somewhat more jaded about the brand occasionally. Interesting. And he really, really wants one. It is his aspirational watch to have an Explorer. But he can't afford it. He just can't afford it. He hasn't got... He's not at that point in his life where he can spend 6000 plus on a watch. Mm -hmm. And I find that just a little bit sad because we were lucky we could do it very much so yeah and it's something that needs to be addressed and we actually commented on it on another piece when we were um one of the few brands i've sold that i bitterly regret selling it was was iwc i sold a galapagos and i um an aquatimer galapagos mm -hmm. uh, because i got slightly frustrated with the vulcanized rubber on it um <laughs> notice we got the vulcan pun in there international star trek day um <laughs> but the um I got frustrated with the watch. Now, I wish I'd kept it, but when I look at the new engineer and I see it at 10,000 plus pounds, and I do think, this is a lot of money for what is, to all intents and purposes, a tool watch. And that, that's been a real change. I think it's been growing since the 90s and the influx of the collector sphere. Because, lest we forget, a Rolex watch was brought to the market to compete with Omega by being very rugged, more, rugged so, more, more so rugged than an Omega, but also much cheaper. Mm. Rolex watches were the cheaper option back in the day. And then they even introduced Tudor that was even cheaper. Um, I didn't you're know Rolex me, you're giving was me I didn't know Rolex eyes. was... I know you've... No, it's great. I did not know. I genuinely did not know that Rolex <laughs> was cheaper than Omega when it came out. Well, if you, if you take a vintage Rolex, the thing that we all love is honestly the fact that it's crap. Rattly bracelets, yeah. very, very simple cases... No complicated chronographs for the most part. They would do timing with loose bezels with no clicks in the early days. Those were, those were cheaper watches. They, they, they couldn't compete with Omega in terms of quality, so they had to find a diversification, which is, well, let's go and make a watch for professionals and let's make it affordable. Even with things like um, some of the early days of the Submariner, sort of middle of the, the vintage life, if you like, having the 5512, which was cost certified, and then a cheaper version, the 5513, that wasn't. So hobbyists could buy one too. Hmm. It was, it's the kind of product that you would go to your local tackle shop, buy all your gear, and there would yeah. be a Rolex to buy too. It was, just, it was literally a tool. It was, it was part of your kit, and they needed to make them affordable uh, to do that. Um, and the fact that they introduced Tudor to be even cheaper is, is I think, if, if we're going to throw any criticism at Rolex to the pricing, at the very least, they still... They have still given us Tudor. And to be honest, a lot of the Tudor offerings are watches I prefer. The Rolex name is obviously preferable, but the Tudor look, the that 54, the Black Bay 54, for me is, as long as it's not too small for me if I try it, is almost a perfect watch. Mm. Well, it's really interesting. I've marked it on a feature there as my watch of the show. Yeah, same same for me. Yeah, it's just it, it's beautiful, and I think they've. It's a very clever design to have created a watch that will appeal to just about any demographic of buyer. Yeah. Yet they've still managed to successfully channel the old vintage sub. Yep. Yeah. And, and I, I massively think, undercut Omega whilst doing it. Yeah, I, th I think you know, f fair play to them. I think they've really nailed it on that, um, and they, yeah. they deserve to be successful with that. And, and I think it's really interesting as well, again, talking, say, to the aforementioned 
young writer we have, he sees Tudor as an equally aspirational brand. He's not from the age group who sees Tudor as what you bought when you couldn't necessarily afford a Rolex. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and it, he's alarmed that my very first Rolex was an Air King 14,000. And I spent £999 on that. <laughs> New. It, it yeah. seems, you, well, you, you, it probably cost that to have its service now. <laughs> it, it, it's alarming. I find the price is alarming. But hey, I mean, we all do. And I think we've just got to accept it's the new norm. Very much so, yeah. And as someone who very much begrudges the cost of things going up, I've done various calculations in argument with my in-laws um, to see how how the cost of things versus the average salary have generally changed into the mm. <laughs> into the harder to achieve um, so, I mean, the, the long and short of it is I'd rather have a house than a watch. So what's great is that people like Tudor are bringing in stuff that's more affordable. And there are even more value brands than we've ever had before. So you, you can, in a way, have your cake and eat it, but unfortunately not specifically with Rolex. I, I agree wholeheartedly. Now, obviously, in your day job, as opposed to your fun job at Watch Some Wonders... <laughs> it's um, all fun. It's, so they tell me <laughs> uh, that you're, you're obviously in contact with a, an almost inconceivable number of watches for us mere mortals. Um, Watchfinder is our go-to. We've all used it. It's our go-to for uh, the best selection, I think, imaginable. Um, I very recently helped a friend spend uh, an alarming amount of money with you for her first gold Rolex. <laughs> and you'd be delighted to know she did get it from you. Excellent. Thank you very much. What can you just give us for those of us who are so used to logging into it, say, as an Internet resource? Could you just give us just a little history, the background of the company, how it came to be and how you came to be this force within the industry that you are now? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Watchfinder started in 2002. Uh, so 21 this year. So it's, it's old enough to drink in America. And um, it started as a combination of things. One, a love of watches, and two, the inability to buy and sell watches in a safe and secure environment, in a, in a trustworthy, you know, when you can put all of those questions about the purchase to the back of your mind and just focus on which one do I like? Hmm. Um, that didn't exist. It was forums at best, exchanges outside a bank, those kinds of things. It was a very, uh, it was a very tricky situation to be in. And uh, so our founders decided they wanted to do something about that. And they had experience with online uh, business and they had their own watch collections. And so they put two and two together and really they they were the first to do that. And so uh, Watchfinder has been able to grow off the back of that innovation, if you like. I hate to use that word. The Swiss use it all the time to say they've created a new screw that goes left instead of right and they say innovation. But this this really was something that was uh, brought a lot of value to collectors and I actually discovered Watchfinder, not through a, a job interview, a job description, but I was a customer first. Um, uh, and, I, and I bought some of my first watches from Watchfinder. And because the experience was so uh, easy and worry-free. Uh, and so that's how I ended up joining, by being a customer first. Uh, and so over the years, it's created a platform that other people have, have been able to mimic. And you know, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, or whatever the expression is. And uh, and so we're now seeing other pre-owned retailers coming up to offering different specialisms in different locations. And it's it's given us, one, the motivation that we're doing the right thing, and two, the motivation to innovate further and uh, and, and give more to um, give more to the customers, which is really where the, the, the YouTube channel started to come about. Uh, the idea of building community and not just having a place for you to think about the commercial side of buying a product, but also to take some time to enjoy a community, talk mm-hmm. to other people, engage in content and, and learn uh, and immerse yourself in the entertainment and the history side of it as well. Uh, and that, that's really what we're, we're going to be to pursuing even further. We started doing our own events uh, and not just events where you come along and we have a selection of watches and we kind of press champagne upon you in the hope that you buy stuff, but guest speakers, influencers, um, other brands who have got some really cool stuff that you don't ordinarily get to see uh, around the world where we can actually meet and engage with people. Um, and that, that for me, is 
has been uh, you're talking about the fun part and the and the day job for me the day job is the fun part because essentially i get to do what i want to do as a watch enthusiast but i get paid to do it as well which is just the best of both worlds i think that's actually in truth how we feel at watch gecko as well <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The stockroom is a lovely place to spend your morning coffee, I can tell you. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm working. I'm working. I'm, work, I'm, I'm working. Room. I'm trying on form X as I'm working. Um, so, I mean, obviously, because of the huge spectrum of stock you have, you're in a position you can probably see what's hot and what's not, what's en vogue and what isn't. What mm -hmm. would you say at the moment? Is Here we are in the early part of 2023 what sort of trends are you seeing coming up or dying down at the moment yeah it's it's really good because between one end of the business which is talking to people and engaging with people and you could call it top of the funnel if you like where we're talking to people who may be discovering watches for the first time or you know the old hands who have had many many watches and have seen all kinds of trends come and go all the way through to actually buying and selling watches we see the, the data from both ends so we can see what people are actually purchasing and we can see what people are talking about too and that can help to to guide what we have available in a way that uh keeps it relevant and it keeps it interesting and something that we have seen in the last few months obviously the the last year was a very interesting one when it came to uh pricing rolex went and then it went oh <laughs> yeah. um and we we have seen that that has been changing in the last few months. Leading up into the end of last year, we were seeing a change. But what's really interesting, if you have Rolex, AP and Batek, they were all the big, hot investor type brands that everyone got into because they were hoping to make a, a big, quick buck. All of the brands that are secondary to that, take your Omegas, your Breitlings, your Cartiers, your Tag Heuers, those are the guys that are actually starting to show real promise again now, I'm not saying to go and buy into them for an investment, but what I'm saying is that we're seeing a lot of attention on those brands now. Like they're becoming very, very popular because they held off from going too high and yeah. now they're looking like really, really good value. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. It's it's um, If somebody was looking for a 300-meter dive watch now and they were kind of hell-bent on a Submariner, um, you might want to say, well, you know, th th there's some very good options that, you know, you take a step back and it's it's yep. not a big step back. It's just, just a little step back and you could end up with uh, arguably a, an equally good product at a fraction of the cost. Yeah, 100%. For, for me, a Seamaster is a better product than a Submariner. Yeah. The quality of the Omega Seamaster is higher than the Rolex Submariner. If you look at the, the formation of the case, those lyre lugs, those are harder to make. A Rolex is a much simpler case form. The coaxial escapements, the silicon balance springs, which we saw appearing, I think, for the first time in a, uh, a non-ladies Rolex watch with a 1908, I think that's correct. But they made quite a big deal out of that. Um, and then generally the spec, helium escape valves for the Seamaster, blah, 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 blah. All those things that you'll never use. But in your mind, you know, actually, you bought a better product and it's cheaper. It's been going up, the Omega. Omega know that it's becoming a more popular watch because it was a £3,500 watch a few years ago and now it's into the fives. But it's still a better value product by, I don't know, what's the Submariner now? Eight, nine thousand £9,000 RRP? Oh, at least, yeah. At yeah. least. Uh, or, or you'll get somebody buying one who can't wait and they'll pay... 10% over RRP just to get it quickly. No, obviously, you're not in that position with, Rolex, uh, with Omega. You can just get it. <laughs> you can, yeah. And that's another interesting sign with, with Rolex, actually. Again, from a boring market blah, blah point of view, that we're now seeing the secondary value of Rolex is starting to get much closer to the RRP, which for me is is a benchmark. I don't think we're ever going to see them dip below that, but that means it's now a, a, a solid point for people to think, I can purchase one of those and not feel like it's going to decrease in value. So from a watch finder perspective then, what would you say over, if you looked over a longer period, what are the surefire sellers? What is a watch you'll get in, you'll think, well, as soon as I get a photograph of that, it's going to go straight out again? Yeah, it's, it's less the model and more the price bracket. Ah, okay. We we see a lot more volume at a price bracket that you probably would not imagine because Omega, Rolex, they're all they're all up there. They're all heading to the five to ten thousand pounds. 
Um, I suppose it's no surprise that cheaper watches sell in more volume because, of course, more people can afford them. Um, but for me, we're seeing so much interest in Tag Heuer for people who are looking to buy their first entry level product with a name that they've heard of, a high quality name with a lot of heritage, at least half of it anyway. Um, and Tudor, of course, th there are some models of Tudor, so Black Bay Pros, uh, Chronographs, those kinds of things, they disappear pretty quickly. Uh, because they offer so much value for money. And I think people are very aware that that value is not going to exist forever. Tudor will go up in price. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I think it's really interesting, yeah, because it's, I think if you look at, um, going back briefly to Watches and Wonders, um, one of my, uh, myself and the other principal author, we pick our top three and our bottom three from the show. It invariably, actually, it's the same brands, believe it or not. But um, one of my top three, even though it's a long time since I've bought a Tag Heuer, was the new Bicolor Aqua Racer 200. I, really? The, st the steel and gold? Yeah. I mean, I'm not a goldy guy, as you can see by the lump of titanium on my wrist at the moment. <laughs> but I really saw that as an evolution of that watch. And so often, you know, to, it's really interesting. You, what, the, the words you used earlier were exactly what resonated with me it was the fact that you know the aqua racer for example is a great entry level to the luxury watch genre mm. and i saw real um evolution if i can use that word in this bicolor aqua racer to me it the the the, the way that the metal was brushed the, the 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 matte finish on the case and on the bezel i actually thought you know what this is a really nice watch this is the next level aqua racer and i i I actually quite admired what they did, hence it made it into one of my top threes. And it's not that expensive, and I could have it probably tomorrow if I wanted to. Yeah, I, I do wonder, I'm pleased to meet you because it answers some of that question. I do wonder, because I, I find the Aqua Racer, awesome entry-level product with a, with a great entry-level price. And then when you add the value of gold to it, the value of gold, by relative speaking, diminishes the more expensive the watch is mm. overall. So a gold Rolex... It, it feels like the gold is like a, a step onto it, whereas with the Aqua Racer, I find, especially for the full gold version, which I think is £16,000, oh, yeah. I, I consider that like buying a Volvo and then ticking every single box in the <laughs> in the spec sheet. <laughs> no one does that, and I'm really interested to see who would spend all of that money on a full gold. But I think the, the Biometal is four and a half. Around yeah, I, I, I maybe, well, maybe it says more about us as watch collectors that I didn't find that too alarming. <laughs> Uh, I, gosh, that's a terrible statement on the industry as a whole. <laughs> Anything under five, you think, okay, well, that, that's doable. Yeah, um, there is a massive desensitization to being a watch collector. When you start thinking that, oh, 500 pounds, that's an impulse purchase. You're like, whoa, 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 that's 500 pounds. That's I, that's money. That's money. <laughs> I, I know. And it, it's the it, that's what brings out the superficialness of this world that we, walk, we work in, isn't it? It's, it's, yeah. it's scary stuff. I mean, if, I mean, it's interesting. One of my questions to you was going to be, if you've got somebody who is starting out at their, their, the very first luxury watch, um, what would be, could you give me a top three to look at that you, I think you probably already have really, but you could summarize that are, best value for money for what you're spending and you're going to get a fantastic bit of kit that you'll probably still have in 10 years time mm -hmm. so the three watches i'd pick would probably all be seiko's to be honest okay good if if you want to get a taste of as much watchmaking as you possibly can for as little money as possible in that entry point it's going to be seiko it, they they have the the great advantage of volume production they have heritage and they also have really good looks and spec. Um, all of those things together just make for a, a watch that's a um, fantastic entry point. You know, you can spend two to three hundred pounds. Um, the only downside is they look a bit like Seiko's, don't they? Right. Sometimes you want to branch out into something that has a little bit more interest. And hot plug for you guys, your your Gekota stuff. Um, that has that pop. So, so when, whenever Tom and I we we do a value proposition and we discuss this stuff, we kind of go like, "Well, head head says this, heart says that." 
Um, and there are some really great options uh, within within the Gekota stuff, especially I saw it watch recently. It had a blue C textured dial, which was really, really beautiful. I think it's a collaboration piece. Yeah, that would probably be one of the NTHs, I think, maybe. Yeah, there's and, some good collaborations out there. Although, um, I mean, Mario will almost certainly cut this bit out. For me, it all stops at Phalanx. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I struggle that, with the medical name of that. That that feels very much like, oh, I hit myself in the phalanx. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, <laughs> you can I cut that thought, bit out too I never, if you like. I never thought of that when I came up with a name for it, but okay. <laughs> no, we can leave that in because now I'm going to be all, all the way home in the car tonight. I'm going to be thinking, gosh, yeah, it does sound a bit like a part of the anatomy, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Being um, someone who who dallies with words all the time, likewise, you know, I, I take great pleasure in reading other people's writing and uh, interpreting it in a different way that makes them upset. So <laughs> enjoy uh, that. No, can assure you, we're not upset by that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there are so many choices. The great thing is for me is that between the the big big boys like Seiko. And between some of those, uh, the smaller brands that are making, like the micro brands that are making independent stuff, there's access to very reliable movements. So people don't need to be concerned about that. And modern manufacturing means that really just pick the one that you like the look of. There aren't many bad watches out there, really. Even even uh, where a lot of product is actually made, even China, they're starting to release their own brands where you can get great value for money and know that it's actually going to be reliable. Like a, a $600 uh, Seagull Torbjorn is not, it's not a bad watch. It's not a bad watch. It's not gonna just be a desk toy when it inevitably goes bang. It, it will last you and it will do well. So that's why I think it's a, a, a game of two halves where on, one, on the one hand you go, oh, all the brands that I dreamed of for the last 10 years have all just wandered out of my price range, but they have been backfilled by so many more, offering so much variety. Do you know, I liken it to um, music. We all listen to music. If you remember the, the 90s and thousands, and in your case, maybe the 1920s, I'm not sure. You're not far <laughs> off. But there was an era where music built up to a peak, I think in the late 90s, not necessarily in quality, but in popularity, where communication of music had grown to an enormous amount with the beginnings of the introduction of the internet but it was still just a few people talking about it so you had massive bands like oasis massive now you don't really have artists that are as massive you've got the tail end of a few from the thousands but you don't really see new bands coming out that are massive but what you have is so many more great bands that you can pick and choose and find on spotify and discover something that is interesting and unique and speaks to you even if they won't go and be the greatest biggest band in the world yeah. and that's what it's like for me for watches there's more choice you just have to do a little bit more work as a consumer to go and find that product you know i think that's a really good analogy and it, it leads me on to something that i definitely wanted to touch with which is the micro brands the smaller brands something that at our end here we're we're quite passionate about because you know, i guess we are one of them um i have grown over the last year to really love formex I think what you're getting for the money is exceptional. Um, I've been lucky enough to spend time with the Formex team, for example. Um, how do you, I mean, is there a reason why some of these smaller brands don't yet appear on WatchFinder? And can you see a day when they will? So it's really a life cycle. And I was talking about this, this funnel earlier, where at one end you have what we do on the YouTube channel where we're discovering brands ourselves and where we're talking to people and seeing what the buzz is and, and sharing things that we discover with people uh, to, in, to increase their awareness. And then at the other end, you have the purchase and sale experience and that's at the complete other end. So with a lot of these independent brands, these smaller micro brands, they've really been appearing over the last few years. And that cycled through to people selling them to WatchFinder there, there is a period of time in which that happens. But we, we have identified that there is frog in a hot pan as product like Rolex has become more and more expensive. Customers on average still have the same amount of money to spend. And so there are these brands that are coming to backfill. Uh, and that's where our attention is at the front end, talking to people, sharing our discoveries, 
and that will inevitably filter through to the watchfinder product that's available for sale uh, over a matter of time. If if we were selling new watches, then they would already be there. But we we look after the secondary, and so that means that that product has to make its way to there in the first place. And I guess loads of people there enjoying their watches so much that they haven't thought about selling them yet. That no, it's it's a very interesting. Um comparison use i guess it's why th- th- there's a certain point before uh, a new car becomes second ha- available on the second hand market they've got exactly. to sell the new ones first exactly um, yeah I- if there was a watch that uh, you would say to someone of say you've got x amount of money to spend doesn't matter how much if there was one watch to buy that you could say categorically this is one of the greatest of all time and it will never let you down. What would you choose? I know I'm putting you on the spot here. A single watch, <laughs> what would you choose? Well, it is, I, I struggled with this question myself for a very long time in terms of a personal purchase because I knew what that watch was, but I didn't want to accept it because when something is good, when something is timeless, when something has more than just a, a, a wow factor for now, it usually means it's boring. Mm. things that are classic and timeless have to they have to fly over the top of trend don't they so it's going to be a watch that's a little bit smaller it's going to be a watch that pulls its looks from vintage it's going to be a watch that is more functional than visual and for me if you're going to throw value into that as well it's going to be a Tudor Black Bay now I was going to say 58 it was the 58 for me that was the watch that I ended up purchasing myself even though I consider it to be, it's not an exciting watch. It doesn't make me go, oh my God, I love watches, but it's just so good. Mm. But it might be the 54 now. It might Ah, be the 54. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, I I hear you. Um, If you'd fired the question the other way, mine was going to be, and and I'm I'm so boring in the office here with it. It's the the Speedmaster professional moon watch. To me, if, if somebody can save up for it, it's a prize always worth having. No, no crystal backs, just steel back, Hesselite crystal on the front, the, the, the classic moon watch. It's still, some, it's still a watch I've had for 10 plus years that gives me a buzz when I look at it. A it, buzz altering? Ah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, uh, I, I agree with you there. I think that is the, the perfect watch for the collector because a lot of the features of a moon watch are quite annoying for someone who just like who just wants to have a nice watch like the manual wind the the fact that the manual wind on some of the older ones is quite tricky actually mm. it takes a little bit of you need a good grip you need to get some calluses on your index finger and thumb some of those things are quite annoying and the newer one is actually quite it's, it's getting up there in terms of price it's still half the price of a Daytona but it's it's increased in price but for everything it packs in in terms of heritage how it how it grabs you as an enthusiast it's perfect although sapphire case back all the way Oh, really? Okay. Well, we'll have to agree to disagree on that. Although, admittedly, I only have to look at my Hesselite crystal and it scratches. So maybe there are days when I would agree with you. (laughs) I've got shares in Polywatch. All right. Um, Now, on a slight spin on that theme, um, I was looking, one of your last videos I watched, actually, just yesterday, where you were talking about the moonshine. Yeah. (laughs) And... Um, are we just, talking a moon swatch moonshine or are we talking moon watch moonshine? No, we're talking about the moon swatch moonshine. Oh, good. <laughs> um, as opposed to the liquid that comes from Tennessee or whatever. But <laughs> it, it, it's as a Speedmaster and NASA enthusiast, um, I'm ambivalent. I won't deny about the moon swatches. I wish I'd thought of them. But. I would be very curious from your perspective how you feel the moon swatch. What's the longevity of that watch? Do you really think there will be the same buzz a year from now? Uh, Well, given the condition that mine is in, the physical longevity of the actual product is not very long at all. (laughs) Um, But I, I think, so talking about watches of the now and watches of the future, the moon swatch for me is a watch of the now. And I I don't resent it that. I think it's a fantastic idea and I really, really like the principles behind it, which is to, as we've been discussing, give people a flavour of what is unattainable in an attainable package. 
And everything about the idea works, but really it's the execution that fell down. And I don't think that's entirely Swatch's fault. I don't think they anticipated just how popular it was going to be. And boy, was it popular. And unfortunately, it befell the very same problems that a lot of other watch brands have, which is that the popular watch becomes a commodity. And so the people purchasing it aren't the people who ultimately want it. And that's short of interviewing every person who wants to buy a moon swatch. That's kind of out of their hands. Um, we're seeing now, I, I've seen a slight um, attitude shift towards the moon swatch now where we kind of, there's an initial excitement. Oh, this is cool. This is exciting. And then, uh, oh, okay, well, no one can actually get one. And it's just been purchased by scalpers and sold um, for many, many multiples more. Now it's becoming available again. Never mind the moonshine. That whole thing is just like a little kind of pop to get some some more press. Um, but now it's becoming available again. Now you can walk into a shop and say, oh, oh, they have some. Actually purchasing one and the initial experience I think they wanted you to have, which is to go, oh, this is fun. I'm just going to I'm just going to buy one and enjoy it and put it on a better strap immediately. That I like. I like. I have one. My wife has one. We purchased them together. Um I, I got hers for her birthday and bought one for myself as well. Of course. <laughs> you know how birthdays are. It's for everyone, right? Absolutely, yeah. And, and I pop it on on the weekend and I enjoy it. And that's what I think they wanted it to be. And that's where it works. Will I still have it in 10 years' time? Will it survive 10 years' time? I, I'm sceptical on both of those points. But um, where, where £6,000 for the RRP of a Moonwatch might just seem too far for people spending a few mm. hundred pounds and being able to yeah. walk in and get one is a nice experience. I think it's been a fascinating developmental journey, a fascinating, fascinating marketing experience. I think all of us in the industry can look at it and learn from it. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, we can only dream of the kind of PR that the watch initially got. I like yourself. I, I haven't succumbed yet. Uh, simply because I couldn't really see it next to my Speedmaster. But we've got three in the office here, and I find myself constantly picking them up and playing with them. There's, yeah. the, there is a fascination with it, and uh, I I can't deny that they've come up with a very successful little package. And I think, it, to me, exactly as you said, the the real gem of it, the real, the, the real cleverness in it is getting people the brand, getting it affordable, getting them something on the wrist that they probably didn't think they'd have. And because of what they've paid for it, if it's a bit clunky in a few years' time, they're not going to lose any sleep over it. I, I, as I said, it's just something I wish we'd all thought of. Much as I would love to sit and talk about watches, and our audience would love me to sit and talk about watches all day with you, um, there is a common subject that I wanted to touch base with, and that is sci-fi. Because it is, as we mentioned earlier, International Star Trek Day. First contact day today. I can't believe any of our audience will go and look that up. But there you go. Um, any more books in the offing? Oh, blimey. Um, I do have one. Uh, it's it's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. I don't know if you've got time and your audience have the patience to hear the story. <laughs> They'll soon um, fast forward this bit if they're not sci-fi people. Yeah, I, I don't want to kill your attention at all. <laughs> Um, but I, I write sci-fi books and I've written them mm. for many, many years since I was uh, 19. Uh, and I have five or six. I can't even remember. Uh, and and I, I self-publish those. And uh, I have an agent who publishes the audiobook versions as well. Uh, but the whole, the whole way the market works has changed. And the self-published authors have to produce a book a month, wow. which is unbelievable. You know, writing 20,000 words a day. Um, to keep up with this stuff. Uh, and so I, I have a book that is done and has been done for years. And I'm, I'm trying to find a way to, to publish that. That doesn't mean I just fall straight to the bottom and get completely ignored because that'd be a waste of time. Mm. Um, what is great is that through my personal channel, I can mention that I, I write books and people purchase them, which is really, really great. So it's given me a, a new kind of kick in the pants to, to get started with that stuff again. Because uh, I very much enjoy it. Uh, us, us writers all enjoy weaving a story of complete fiction and taking a, a, a an audience somewhere else. It's it's a very powerful and very. It's a very. Um, this is great. I can't even think of a word. What a great writer I am. <laughs> it's a very rewarding thing to be yeah, able to sure. do to 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 take someone and put them somewhere else and make them experience emotions. But in the meantime, 
I'll tell a few little short stories on the on the on YouTube, and that that keeps me satisfied. Well, I mean, hopefully we can get one here. Uh, we've got a couple of books up here. I can just see above me there is an Ian Fleming first edition, which Ooh. I gifted to the office here for, for to to use as a prop with the Bond straps. So um, yeah. maybe if we're very lucky, we could have an Andrew Morgan book in the office. Oh, by all means, by all means. Amazon, they're on there. <laughs> right, we, we, we'll, we'll do what we can to try and acquire one. Um, so you, you have got another book in the offing. Can you give us a, a sneak preview of the story or is it highly classified? Uh, do you know what? I wrote it several years ago and I, I genuinely have to dig back that far into my mind to remind myself what it's about. Um, oh yeah, I remember. So I remember watching a really interesting YouTube video uh, about the fifth domain. So in warfare, you've got uh, land, sea, air, space, and now the internet. Uh, and there's a genuine threat that uh, you, basically you do not have to fire a single bullet to wage war with another nation. All you have to do is create a divide between people in a single nation via the internet. Now, this is, this is true. This is happening. This, this is a, a, a very real and prevalent threat that happens that divides nations into two very extreme sides by throwing in little hand grenades of words and opinions. Oh, hey, what do you think about subject, controversial subject, and people just go at each other and you, you see a nation fall. And this, this, the book that I've written is about that, is about manipulating politics and world governance through the use of the written word. Which, I mean, how meta is that, right? Wow. In a book. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> I, I, um, like, I find it very plausible, very believable. Um, having had a previous career in central government, I find it alarmingly plausible. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really there. And we all fall into the, the trap of it because the most... The most alarmist and sensationalist things are the things that get the most eyeballs, but they also create the most division. And it's it's something that can be used harmlessly to talk about watches. So one person go, oh, I like Omega. Oh, I like Rolex. But when you talk about two political powers, what it does is it forces the, the, the politics to become more divided because someone who sits in the middle who has reasonable things to say doesn't appeal to anyone. And so it creates a, a backwards and forwards between more and more extreme uh, uh, views. Oh, that's very political, isn't it? It oh. is, and it sounds like we're talking about the top story on BBC News last night as well. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. We managed to touch briefly on sci-fi, which I enjoyed. It was very self-indulgent. Thank you for letting me do that. More importantly, we spoke about all things watches. Andrew, thank you so much for taking some time for the watch gecko video channel it's a real pleasure thank you very much for having me and um, being great to to meet you for the first time actually and uh, talk to you about watches insult you in places as well um and you've been a, a really good sport thank you we have broad shoulders here and we will get a revenge <laughs> one day don't worry <laughs> oh god uh, we'd what love to I invite done? you back at some point i mean it's great we love these chats especially if there's something relevant or irrelevant to talk about we don't care as long as it's watch related would you Come back one other time, please. Absolutely. Now I've got all my technology set up. It'll be much slicker. People don't realise, but it took me quite a while to get connected to this call because despite looking very youthful, I am actually, when it comes to technology, quite an old man. Uh, well, I'm lucky. I have Mario, which everybody at Watch Gecko knows, but nobody can see at the moment. Uh, on <laughs> I that, need a Mario. Oh, you need a, everybody needs a Mario in their life. And on that bombshell, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is Richard signing off. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Please always go over to the Watch Gecko magazine to have a look and see what we're writing at the moment. There's lots of stuff about Watches and Wonders. And join us again here soon. Thank you.